I, I have you. So the blue one is deep learning, and the second is Apache Spark. Who of you knows Apache Spark? Okay, Apache Spark is an uh, open source uh, distributed data processing engine uh, which scales linearly, and that was really a hype. But here, uh, deep learning was like overtaking Apache Spark, so that's the first. Then there's another yellow line. Do you imagine it's the yellow line? It's even more than um, deep learning, and it had a really high spike, and it was flattening out, and it was along with deep learning getting a second. Excuse me? Yeah. It's a hype uh, term at the moment, just artificial intelligence. And the uh, third one, which is constantly increasing, any idea? Uh, no, it's a uh, GPU. And I think those three are correlating, in my opinion, deep learning, AI, and uh, GPU. Of course, there are some bias because of cryptocurrency, um, but, but I think a lot of hype is also driving the GPU sale. So uh, now the question is, how can we make neural network training and inference faster? And there are four par paradigms in doing so. One is intermodal parallelism, one is data parallelism, one is intramodal parallelism and pipeline parallelism. So I will just co cover all four of those now. So you have uh, model A and there's the notion of hyperparameters. So the parameters are the weight matrices, the different weight vectors in each layer. Those are the parameters you are training using gradient descent. But there's a set of hyperparameters in each model, for example, number of layers, number of neurons, type of activation functions, learning rate, uh, optimize, type of optimizer, and so on. And those hyperparameters are still considered uh, um, as black magic, so choosing the correct ones, or it's just a brute force uh, evaluation. So that's a thing you can do easily. Uh, you put one model with a hyperparameter set A on one node, and then two others or two other nodes. Straightforward, no? it's just copying the model, changing the hyperparameters and running it once. That's easy. But um, <coughs> yeah, then you show each model the same amount of data, and then you choose based on the accuracy score which model to take. Um, if you want to parallelize one single model on multiple nodes, what you do is you take the model, you copy it to each node, same model with the same hyperparameters, and then you partition your data and you train each model only on a partition of the data. And during training, you are updating the weights in each model. So, of course, the weights are now different because the weights are depending on your training data. But then there is a parameter server. So, regularly, you send your weights to the parameter server. And you simply average all the weights, and you send them back. And that's uh, working pretty well. So the, the Google brain was the first large-scale implementation of this, and now everybody's doing it like that. Um, so there's a, another notion of intramodal parallelism, where you can take the model apart. If it, for example, doesn't fit into one single GPU, you can use multiple. And an intuition how, or let, let's say a simple proof that you can partition a model is uh, the following. You see here you are uh, computing x times w, and those operations are independent of each other, and then of course you can compute those in parallel. Uh, and then last, what you have is pipeline parallelism, and this is uh, the way how data is processed in neural networks. So you have your input data set, you take the first row, you compute first row in the first layer, and you take the second row, you compute the second row in the first layer, and now in parallel you can compute the result of the first row in the second layer. So that's pipeline parallelism. Um, just going over Apache Spark, it's not so relevant for understanding, it's just an example um, how this is done in different frameworks. So there's a framework for deep learning for J, uh, for Java. And it's just one line of code you have to change in order to parallelize it along Apache Spark. Um, there's another framework that's actually one, that's the TensorFlow of IBM. So it's also open source, it's systemml.apache.org, <coughs> which uses Java as execution 
uh, over C++ and how it, uh, it can create a cost-based uh, dynamic execution graph. So in TensorFlow, you remember, you define using Python code the structure of a static execution graph in system ML. Uh, it's basically even older than Apache Spark in TensorFlow. You have a domain-specific language in R syntax and uh, an optimizer which takes statistics of your data into account and creates an optimal execution graph. And it can also read in Keras models and then execute it on any type of hardware. And even it can make decisions for each operation where to place it on a CPU, on a GPU, on a cluster, whatever. So that's pretty cool. We are using that a lot in uh, IP Watson Health, that uh, framework. Uh, those two I will skip TensorFrames and TensorSpark because they are quite outdated. Only one thing uh, I want to show you is uh, Kaffee on Spark because here there is another way for parameter averaging because you cannot only send it to a central parameter server, you can also uh, use some sort of a ring topology and each worker now communicates in a ring topology with each other worker and the averaging is done in a ring. That's actually removing the single uh, bottleneck of the parameter server. And that's something we have used uh, successfully. Uh, I will come back to that later. So in parallel training, especially in GPUs, you have one problem in the Intel architecture that the GPU is attached to the main system using PCI Express 3. And that means you have here your training time on the GPU and you have um, um, that you have the transfer time. And if you have multiple nodes, you have also the network time. So you should mitigate those and you can mitigate those times uh, using faster interconnects. So that's where um, the power system comes in. So besides having a more sophisticated uh, CPU architecture, there is a connector which is uh, at the moment it's 300 GB per second, so it's 10 times faster than PCI Express 3, and that now enables you to access the um, main memory of your system from the GPU in a faster way, so the bottleneck is gone. And in my opinion, the main reason why we don't see such a huge breakthrough in GPU technology or deep learning is the bottleneck between the main memory and the GPU memory. So that's mitigated. And the second latency issue is um, the network. So if you have normal Ethernet, you can go up to uh, 25 GB, uh, gigabit at the moment, but usually you have 1 or 10 gigabit per second. And here, this is an Israeli company called Melanox, and they have to better uh, now the fastest infinite band switch in the world. So this is an example of a 40 port switch, which has 200 gigabit per second per port. And also it's not an ordinary switch, it's a so-called switching fabric, which has 40 times um, 200 gigabits. So between all ports it has 200 gigabits at the same time. So it's 40 times 200 gigabit per second of total throughput on, on that switch. And uh, also it has the SHA protocol, um, which is basically an FPGA. Who doesn't you, know what the FPGA is? So FPGA is a field programmable gate array where you can flash the actual, let's say, hardware layout into the chip. And that you can now go on the, on the switch. And what they have done with IBM is the gradient parameter averaging is now done in the switches. And that's, that's making it really fast. So you see here, Power AI platform is an open platform. Even Google is using the Power platform. And you, we have now built a system with 64 of those OAI machines with 256 NVIDIA V100 uh, GPU parts. And you see here, we put increased scaling efficiency. So we are approaching 100% here, reducing the training time and also increasing the accuracy. The reason why we increased, we could increase the accuracy is that since the network and GPU transfer time is now faster, we could choose smaller batch sizes. So the batch size is one of the hyperparameters. 
and uh, that affects the, the performance of the neural network. If you are if you are having a lot of latency in the network and the GPU, you tend to use larger batch sizes because then the relation between the latency latency and your training time is uh, low. But since we have now a fast interconnect between GPU and memory and in, uh, interconnect between the nodes, it could reduce the batch size and therefore the accuracy increases. So that's uh, and actually the fastest supercomputer on the world is using that our AI machines now. Um, yeah, that's just uh, the courses I'm teaching. So, so uh, it's the IBM Advanced Data Science Specialization uh, on Coursera, and those are four courses. The first is fundamentals. Uh, the second is advanced machine learning and signal processing. So we teach um, how to scale the, the state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms on clusters. And then all the stuff I've been talking about today is in that one. And then we have. Uh, one project which you need to pass to prove that you are actually capable of finalizing one data science uh, project end to end. And yeah, that's the URL. So if you have it, there's also free audit only mode. So you don't have to pay for it, but you don't get a certificate then. Okay, so what's the time now? 15. So I'll tell you uh, how much do we have. Now, on that, we are on 3% now. And we are just waiting for the next 
news that we have been pushing that further down. So that's how all this stuff was starting. Uh, maybe that you have seen already in your style transfer. You can train an algorithm to learn a style of an artist and he can then recreate uh, image based on one source image and we draw it using a style. That's called neural style, so you can search for that. Um, have you heard about YOLO? Who has heard about YOLO? Okay. Uh, let's see if we have sound here. So this is 10 times faster than uh, the 20 seconds per image detector. And you can see that by the time it makes predictions, the entire state of the world has changed. Uh, and this wouldn't be very useful for an application. If we speed this up by another factor of 10, this is a detector running at five frames per second. This is a lot better. But for example, if there's any significant movement, I, I wouldn't want a system like this driving my car. So then uh, Yolo came. Sorry, getting loud. Okay, it's faster now. Um, that's that was an example of a full HD stream on a single GPU. So you can just Google for YOLO how they are doing it. So YOLO stands for you only do it once. So this is an example how 3D models can be extracted from uh, 2D video streams. Um, so here question, what do you think? What was first, the image or the caption? Who thinks the image was first? Who thinks the caption was first? Who doesn't understand my question? So, this is a data set, and this is a data set. Which one was the label, and which one was the features? Okay, you, you think the caption has been created from the image. But actually, it's the other way around. So, uh, image labeling, that's an uh, old story, 2017. Now, 2018, we are creating images from so that gives you an intuition where the journey goes to. Just be creative and uh, throw a lot of data at a new network and of course adjust a new network in order to, to stick to your new idea and it most probably will work. And that's not, yeah. Is, is the image being created or has a root set of data and you're just picking one element from it? So it's created. So using a solution in your networks, it has been trained of a huge set of mappings between labels and images, but then it's fed new labels, unseen labels, into and it synthesizes new images through the already trained one. So that, that's why I have this slide here. It's, it's really important that you notice that that's the direction we are going to. The neural network can learn things which we are able to learn, and we just have to be brave and let the neural network do it. But there are lots of other details that are not in the caption, but are in the picture. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's, uh, that's based on the training data, no? because, for example, if, if it's a baseball player, there's always some grass on the training data, and if you create grass, for example. That, that's biased, no? You can mitigate that if you have more training data, for example, say baseball player uh, is throwing a ball in a game uh, on a sandy playground, I don't know, or in India. No, it's cricket in India, so it doesn't work. Um, anyway. um, so you see here a clear uh, study that um, automatable tasks are highly at risk. So, so those are the areas where the deep learning algorithms will actually be applied in the next couple of years. And it includes uh, processing data. So any person which copies text from a sheet of paper into the computer is highly uh, under risk for the next couple of years. Um, then openness is one important thing for AI. So that's my NAS storage at home. And I like it that I can open it anytime. And I can pull out the hard drives and I can attach it to a Linux box. And it still is readable. 
and that's something which, which is important. So uh, hardware accelerators are highly under research now. So CPUs you have, you know, that's the power nine compute, that's not a city from top. Um, that I've already covered. So this is I already have covered, this I have covered also. Um, so FPGAs, I introduced a bit before on the Menelux switch, but actually we are doing some research on FPGAs as well for as main computational unit in neural networks. So this is now uh, from IBM Research Zurich uh, prototype where the FPGAs are directly attached with uh, 25 gigabit per second ethernet. Uh, and this card here is the Cisco top rack switch, switching fabric, which has 25 gigabits of ethernet on each port. So you can access each FPGA at a speed of 25 gigabit per second. And at the moment you can play the racks with four uh, you can have uh, 4,000 of those FPGAs. And uh, currently we are doing two things. We are um, implementing a SQL to FPGA compiler for that system and uh, TensorFlow, some TensorFlow nodes. So some TensorFlow nodes will be now able to make use of this uh, uh, system. So FPGAs is the next generation. And then after that come uh, ASICs, application specific integrated circuits which have the algorithm burned into the hardware. And uh, IBM has here the IBM True North chip, which is a neural chip which runs a neural network in CD core on the chip. It even doesn't have the clock, so it's more inspired uh, from a human brain. And with our partner, uh, Inilabs, they have a camera sensor, which like the retina only sends data downstream if the contrast changes. So an ordinary camera sensor is sampled, so the whole frame is sampled 40 times per, 50 times per second up to 1000 times per second on consumer cameras. But here, automatically, without a clock, without a sampling rate, whenever contrast changes on the chip, the signal is sent. So that means you have already a motion filter on the, on the image sensor, and using then the neural chip, so uh, neural chip that was processing that feature space here, uh, they got 96.5% 96 of accuracy for movement pattern detection. But the most interesting part here is only consuming uh, 0.2 watts, the whole thing. And that's if you compare to an NVIDIA chip, it's nothing. I think the NVIDIA V100 consumes uh, 300 or 400 watts. So another thing to address is robustness. So for us, it's easy to classify those images, but actually for neural network, it's it is not. And it's always important to check what a neural network is actually taking into account for example for classification. So this is a classification example between dogs and huskies, and it turns out that the neural network only looks at if there is snow or not in the picture. So that's dangerous, no? because then you trust the neural network and it just computes crap. Uh, then there's the problem of uh, adversarial examples. So here you have a giant panda classified with uh, 0.84 uh, points of accuracy. Now you can add adversarial noise, so that's specific noise, it's not white noise, specific noise. But then for us the image looks the same, but the classification changes. And that's uh, even more severe in self-driving cars. So if you add adversarial noise, you can even remove the pedestrians. And, uh, or, for example, you can have stealth comments to your home assistants. So the research group was uh, able to emit inaudible voice comments to Alexa. So Alexa was just uh, confirming the order on Amazon, but nobody was hearing actually the order because it was stealth to the human ear, but still Alexa was recognizing it as a command. And intuitively, why this is possible? So in high dimensional space, you always have a gap between the real or the optimal decision boundary and the actual decision boundary of your model. And in that gap, you can always add examples in its chest. Uh, the trick to find, uh, find the gap and actually create those adversarial noise in the system. 
So in order to address that, we have open sourced the adversarial robustness toolbox, which has this set of uh, attacks and defenses and metrics built in, and it's basically a Python library, which you can then just apply to your neural network and, and assess it. And the second problem which you see is bias. So have you heard about the compass algorithm? US. So in US, there's a new algorithm which tells uh, police and court the risk of recommitting crime for a specific individual. And uh, they found out that the algorithm is racist. Uh, so if you are black, you have nearly 50% chance of recommitting crime. So that brings us to uh, other statement. The problem of a racist AI is not always the problem of the AI. This is the problem of a racist world. So we are creating those racist AIs, but uh, we have also open sourced another tool to mitigate this. So we can now ex uh, assess bias against any target. For example, here we uh, check the sex attribute, and now we check or see here that we have uh, bias against females in the model. And maybe that's also true in the real world. So the data is only reflecting the real world. But we want to AI to be better than the real world, so therefore we have a set of algorithms which we can uh, use and then transform the model into a bias-free model without changing the model. So we are just changing the data in order to make it bias-free. So that's also really available. Uh, that's what's the studio thing I have shown you already. Uh, if you know only one thing in what you have in, in Boston Studio, that's a uh, data refinery. So 95% of your data science workload is data integration, data cleansing. And we have some AI tools which help you there. Um, and uh, another cool thing is that we have flexible runtime. So you can have a low amount of CPU and um, storage and memory resource for developing your algorithm. And when it comes to training, you just have a drop down and you can then choose uh, many CPU cores or GPUs and edit and throw it at your problem only for the amount of time you need it. Um, yeah, also the hyperparameter tuning is built in, so you can have multiple hyperparameter sets and evaluate those in parallel. Um, and the core of all those software packages we open source, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, we have a model exchange. Yeah, so some, some outlook into the future. So neural network synthesis is a new task where actually you have one neural network creating another one. We have here a prototype, uh, which is called uh, new nets, so neural network synthesis. And that's an example of a convolutional neural network which has been created by another uh, deep learning neural network. So that's one, one area of uh, investing research. Um, so this is the whole bulk part of IBM um, projects we have in that space. So it's all about defining it, um, running it, and then deploying it. And in deployment, it's important uh, to take care of robustness and fairness, and those components we, we open source. So then a bit more into future. So this is a self-driving car concept. Yes. 
to go 